invited to the podium the president of the Incorporated Master Builders Association, Mr. Humphrey Taylor. Continuing education is a most beneficial form of personal development. The INAJ puts on these seminars for members, stakeholders, and just about anyone who thirsts for knowledge. We see the benefit and we will continue to do so. We are at the IMAJ envisioning a future where our professional participants will find continuing education a necessity because, for example, our building practitioners bill no require a practicing certificate, which I'm sure will have you'll have to earn points every year. As the forerunners with these seminars, we are hoping to reach the point where they will be accredited so that you will be awarded points for attending, which will add up to your continuing education program. We also provide a forum for you to network and meet your colleagues and for the students to aspire to our examples as we set for them. The IMAJ wishes for you all a successful seminar and networking event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we will now have our main sponsor's remarks and the, our first sponsor's representative will be not Petal James. This gentleman is no Petal. Um, he is a friend of us in the industry, very knowledgeable, as previously was at the NHT. We welcome Carlton Earl Samuels, Chief Development and Financing Officer at the Jamaica National Group. Jane Bank welcomes the opportunity to be part of the Incorporated Master Builders Association Conference for the fifth consecutive year. We have uh, participated as your major sponsor. And I feel uh, that I'm a part of the IMAJ. As a matter of fact, I was only asked yesterday afternoon to um, sit in for Petal James, who is responsible for a mortgage sales operation at the Jane Bank. I am responsible for the development financing. At the, I operate from the Jain Group, so we ensure that the that Petal, Petal has a job by you creating the buildings, the houses, and so on, so that she can grant the mortgage, so you can continue in business. This IMAJ conference has become an important and welcome event on our calendar at the Jane Group. It provides a forum for insightful discussions and a pace in which we can a space in which we can generate innovative solutions for issues impacting the building and construction sector. <clears throat> Master builders play a unique and pivotal role in shaping the identity of Jamaicans through the soundness and efficacy of the infrastructure that you build and the communities that you design and engineer. Your role in the society, therefore, should never be taken lightly, as your contributions are critical in the strengthening of our construction sector, which plays a pivotal role in the economic and social growth in Jamaica. Ladies and gentlemen, the Jamaica real estate sector, as you have observed over the past few years, has some likely turned to a boom, with major development taking place across the country. And while the explosion in this sector is welcome and good for business, it also raises concerns about the impact these developments could have on our natural resources, 
in particular our water resources, which are critical elements in the agricultural production and the overall economic growth and sustainable development. And my good friend Mark Barnett is here, so I won't steal his thunder because I'm sure he's here to tell you how the important role that his agency play in your um, program. As master builders, I implore you to continue to be an integral part of the conservation and to seek to implement measures that will result in more efficient and cost-saving use of water. We have the capacity and technology to construct more climate-smart homes and buildings in Jamaica. By implementing water adaptation measures, such as water harvesting systems, and installation of efficient fixtures in your units. In addition, we should also ensure that we are adapting the relevant technologies and find new ways to do business in the sector. Similar to other industries, this sector evolves and changes. Hence, we should ensure that we are using the right tools to produce the best results to meet our current situation. At Jane Bank, we are seeking to do our part in this area. Under our water project, which is being implemented by the Jane Foundation in partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank and the pilot program for climate resilience, this water project will enable Jamaican households to be more actively involved in water adaptation practices, including conservation habits, and installing water efficient devices in their households. Jane Bank will also roll out a specially designed loan program with Jamaican householders and the develop which de Jamaican householders and developers can access to install several water efficiency devices, including low flush toilets, energy saving washing machines and dishwashers, and rainwater harvesting. The objective of this program, program is that while we seek to develop our country, we must also do our part to preserve our natural resources. As your partner, we at Jane Bank see it as our responsibility to remind you about the urgency to address these matters so that we can move the construction sector forward by ensuring that we are, com we are competent, strong, and competitive. As a financial company for Jamaicans and leaders in the mortgage financing, Jane Bank is here to support your needs and those of your clients so that you can strengthen your competitiveness. And you'll notice I'm in emphasizing competitiveness. And if I remain with you longer, I will expand on this. We offer you an advantage as Jamaica master builders beyond the commercial banking services that we now do, given our capacity to provide development financing for your projects, which are grounded in our solid experience and expertise, having worked with the housing and construction sector for more than 144 years. Our parent company, the Jamaica National Group, has implemented a development financing unit to provide greater focus on the financing of residential and commercial development. And that unit is spearheaded by me. This unit is responsible for soliciting and processing applications to facilitate the granting of development loans to individuals and corporations seeking to undertake residential, commercial, on our, our land development projects. Loans are provided to qualified borrowers for residential and commercial construction projects at very competitive rates and terms. And I dare say that of all the financial institutions in Jamaica, no one knows the business better than JN. Additionally, a more recent responses to the subject of financing has been the launch of our Design Your Mortgage 
popularly referred to as your DYM options, which allows prospective homeowners or uh, property owners to choose from eight options to finance their mortgage payments. And recently, our DYM Express has significantly reduced the turnaround time for the disbursement of mortgage loans. Uh, and we are achieving this under 30 days. These innovations are in addition to the ongoing reduction in interest rates over the years, which were double digits, as some of you will recall, less than 10 years ago, it was double digit. I remember at one point I was paying 19%. Now we are down to as low as 7.5%. We have listened keenly to the ideas uh, and the requests of our members. And we, I'm here to assure you that JN Bank will continue to work with you to ensure that you become a and you continue to become an integral part of the whole development of Jamaica. Again, we welcome our involvement in this annual conference and look forward to commendable solutions from your presentations. Good morning and have a productive conference. Thank you so much, Earl. And so for those of us who may have challenges financing our development, however so small, um, Earl will certainly give you a listening here. This time now we'll invite the president of the National Water Commission, Mr. Mark Barnett, to give his remarks to inform us how we will supply water to the developments that Earl is financing. Let me welcome Mark. To give a remarks from the NWC is like asking me to speak for the entire day. Because, as you know, water is a very touchy subject. And nonetheless, I will just give you a simple synopsis of, as the chairman mentioned, how are we going to support development. But firstly, when the IMAJ approached NWC to participate as a sponsor, we saw it as a natural fit because by virtue of the work that NWC does, it actually supports the profession. And if companies, let's say local companies, but more so companies like the NWC, which is considered one of the largest government entity for capital spend on an annual basis, then it therefore gives critical reason why we should be part of this process as we do provide the avenue for the profession to grow and for young professionals to remain in Jamaica, which is very critical in my view to our own development. So NWC sees itself as part of that process. But more critically, what is NWC doing and how are we enhancing that process? As you would know, most of our facilities constructed many years ago, in fact, were predominantly done by local contractors, albeit there is some of um, overseas financing in some way. But things have changed, and the critical focus for NWC now is to tackle one of the two critical um, cost factors for us, and that is non-revenue water. And because there is a water energy nexus, by virtue of losing a lot of water, you actually incur a lot of energy costs. And I know my friends at JPS would not necessarily like that because um, being the largest single consumer of the grid, um, power from the grid, any reduction I know may hit JPS on the bottom line. But again, NWC have to see itself as a business unlike what we have done in the past, and therefore our efforts are predominantly geared towards um, cost reduction. So you'd have seen us spending just about 42.5 million US dollars, and I know some persons would have seen some, I, I consider them, uh, you know, some mocking, if you will, of NWC, if you believe in something, just believe in digging it, and stuff like that, but critically to 
our survival as an entity, we must reduce what we consider our non-revenue water, which simply is water that we produce, distribute, and we get no revenue from it. In some instances, it's, it's, it's consumed. And therefore, we believe rather than adding more capacity, we need to address what we are already producing. So if Kingston requires 50 million gallons of water per day, and we are producing 100, just for argument's sake, and you're losing 50% of it, then you're actually producing 50% more than you need to produce. And it's not a matter of whether you have the plant, the production capacity. That is not the issue as it relates to us, but a result of the, the network that exists. Secondly, being that the focus, we tackle in Kingston because, again, it's a commercial center. And our next primary focus for those who intend to move into either Portmore or on the North Coast, we're going to pursue in the next 18 months a non-revenue water activity in Portmore as well. We're going to do the same on the North Coast between Montego Bay and, let's say, St. James to, to St. Anne. And you'll ask the question, what is it that we estimated to spend? For Portmore, we're looking probably about $1.5 billion in Jamaican terms. And on the North Coast, we're going anywhere between uh, up to about $3 billion in, in, in expenditure. But overall, for NWC's overall improvement, both in terms of water and wastewater, we're looking upwards of five billion US dollar to spend to improve in the next five years. And it gives, in my view, a kind of understanding of the level of expenditure that is required in our very critical infrastructure. Because, and I will emphasize, any state that does not invest in its water and sanitation services is not moving to a developed state. If we ignore that level of the, um, investment, we are not moving in the, in, in, in the direction that we ought to. The fact is, water is the most basic necessity for development, both in terms of your public health, etc., etc., and to support industries. So, coupled with that, we have, learned, we have listened very keenly to the Prime Minister's statement to try to make Jamaica's energy mix about 50-50, or let's say 50% um, renewable. NWC sees itself as a critical play in that role, albeit that based on how our systems are, we're not likely to benefit directly um, by the generation, but we believe with, just, with the right mix of contracting and the transaction, we can actually impact on that. And you would have heard in the past or in recent times our promotion of establishing floating solars. We think the Mona Reservoir is a prime location for that. It not only generates the energy that we're looking at, but an open water body always lends itself a high evaporation rate as we are accustomed to based on our temperatures, etc. And so while we estimated of establishing just about a 15 megawatt um, PV system on the reservoir, there are indications to suggest that we can go up to about 40, 44 megawatt PV system. And that is what we'll be pursuing. In addition to that, we'll be looking at all the other water bodies that we own, operate, and seek to establish similar arrangement because there could be or there is a net benefit that could be accrued to NWC as it relates to its overall energy costs. In fact, that energy cost is just about five million US per month. So you can understand why I would encourage all attendees to ensure that you pay your bills and pay them on time 
to ensure that we can continue to have the commodity flow. But there are some critical things, and Earl mentioned one of them, which I thought is, is very important to this gathering. NWC is very integral in the development approval process. And a lot of times there are questions as it relates to one, the timeliness of our response, etc. But I must state it here. The timeliness of response is sometimes a factor of the quality of the submissions. And if we have poor submissions to review, it's eventually going to result in long delays because to and fro is an issue. But what has been happening significantly is how Kingston itself densities are, are increasing. And there's always going to be the question, can you supply water? So let me just give a little bit of insight as to where this may go. So if you plan to go above a certain number of um, floors, be prepared to put in your on-site storage. Because NWC will not be guaranteeing to have the pressure all the way up. Because, again, it's the same pressure that was creating all the leaks in my network. And therefore, designers, builders must consider on-site storage and then you pressure your system to address um, your um, additional floors. In addition to that, with change in density comes um, increased ground cover, or impermeable ground cover in a great, to a great extent. With increased ground cover, as most engineers will know, there's an increased runoff. With increased runoff, there's less percolation to recharge those aquifers that we utilize. And therefore, over time, we're actually reducing the available water resources from underground. It therefore is important, and it's something that we're discussing within NWC, that developments are developers who are proposing such infrastructure we're going to make it mandatory because although it is not necessarily our responsibility, but by virtue of what we recognize could be a challenge for NWC in the future, that all developers need to ensure that there is a rain harvesting system on site to address some of your runoff issues, which are a part of um, a long-term problem. This may seem a little bit hard. It will cost a little bit more, but I want to also raise the point that initial costing and time and value of money is another issue. The investment you make now, in a few years later, um, with inflation, it is not so significant after all. But you would be doing a significant justice to the environment in terms of those um, practices. So, folks, we have to change with the time. We, 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 we continue to ask the question, why don't we put up another dam? Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? I've always insist that you can't put a dam where you're not getting a continuous um, flow of water. You're just putting in an investment that doesn't make any sense. Moreover, where you have a flow in a river that is sufficient, you have to measure that investment that you're going to make for a dam versus the reliability of what we consider um, the dry time flow, which is usually a significant factor in, in, in those instances. So as I've said before, we are unlikely to put a dam up or another dam anywhere up in the hermitage because the flows are not there to support um, such structure. In addition, where we're mainly looking to invest in additional productive production capacity is on the Raya Cobra. And this is where we believe offers the greatest opportunity. But not only that, our approach is a more integrated water resource management um, concept. As you would be aware, 
we have one of the largest funding system called Soapberry out in um, South East St. Catherine, just off the Dyke Road. All that water that is treated is discharged into the Hunts Bay. Now that's a prime resource for other activities. Critically, we believe it could support the Caymanas Economic Zone, which is being contemplated because you don't necessarily need potable water for all industries and such water can be recycled, making it more making more water available for, for portable uses. So that is the concept that we're pursuing. And so NWC, while it may seem as if that much is happening, our thought process is to make things more integrated, but recognizing that every single player in the industry have a key role to play. And therefore, we believe rather than it being a one side NWC versus everybody, it has to be a case of partnership and understanding while we go forward, recognizing that things environmentally are not likely to improve. And it sounds a little bit um, negative, but that's the reality because we still see a lot more fossil fuel being used. We still see the impact from those usage are not based on what we generate within the region. And I now have to go regionally because collectively we don't consume enough fossil fuel to generate enough pollution to create the problems that we, that we have. And so how do we implement systems that is adaptable to mitigate these potential occurrences in the future? And that is what NWC is doing and that's our approach because again this place is too beautiful to allow it to destroy ladies and gentlemen um as i said the issue of water is a very is dear to my heart um and it's something that i could go on and on but i'm sure you're not here to listen to a sponsor but more so to listen to the details of the program which i find very interesting um, from a contracting perspective and I wish you a very successful seminar conference and I hope at the end of the, the day participants will feel pleased and feel um, as if their desire have been fulfilled in terms of the material and the knowledge that has been transferred. I want to thank you very much and have a very good conference. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Mark Barnett. Um, and just, um, Mark has nudged me just to remind everybody that um, the NWC would rather collect than disconnect. And um, so in order not to have JPS disconnecting them, they'd rather collect from you so they can keep the um, the resource. Did I do okay with that, Mark? Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Um, thank you so much, um, Mark Barnett and um, Carlton Earl Samuels. That Earl and I getting so used to the Carlton because all these years we know you as Earl. <laughs> um, it is it is impo it is important um, for the master builders. Our sponsors are important, not only in the sense of helping us to state seminars like these um, at a affordable cost, but also for us to also um, what should I say now um, establish some synergies with those. Um, who operate in the same industry. And Mark spoke about the NWC and their capital spend. That's important for contractors and other industry professionals. And also, Earl had spoken about the financing provided by the JN Group and um, the special um, vehicles that they offer for development. So it all comes together. Um, I don't know who might be, who might not be here. I know JPS is around and I um, would hope that the government, NWA and so on, 
we have two presenters who are eminently qualified to present on the areas that they will be talking about. The session, session two, session one was a nice short session and we heard quite a bit from the NWC and Jamaica National. And we'll be talking about tendering and implementation. The, my name is Donald Moore and I'm the Senior General Manager of Construction and Development at the National Housing Trust. And I'll be the chairman for this session. We have just about two hours, um, one hour dedicated to each of the topic areas. And the two presenters will be Mr. Woodrow Whiteley and Ms. Sharon Donaldson. Please make that adjustment in your program. I don't know where the Mac came from, but it's Sharon Donaldson. The format that we are going to be using is the presentations will be in the order of 35 to 45 minutes, dependent on, the, on, on how fast things seem to be soaking in. And then we'll have a question and answer session after each presentation for the remaining, the rest of the hour, 15 to 25 minutes. Launches after this presentation, so we don't have to rush. I know we are generally fine having attended to the station outside. And so, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I move into the first presentation. Mr. Woodrow rightly is a chartered quantity surveyor, a procurement specialist, adjudicator, and arbitrator. He's a principal for quantity surveying firm Woodrow Whiteley and Associates. I know that most of you are aware of that firm. Mr. Whiteley is a member of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, a fellow of the Jamaica, Jamaican Institute of Quantity Surveyors, and a member of the Trinidad and Tobago Institute of Quantity Surveyors. He's a former lecturer and quantity surveyor program director at the University of Technology, Jamaica. And Mr. Whiteley was responsible for the drafting and structuring of the BSc quantity surveying course and oversaw the transition of that program from the diploma level. Mr. Whiteley is also a commissioner on the National Contracts Commission, serving as a Construction Industry Council's representative and is a founding director of the Caribbean Procurement Institute located in Trinidad and Tobago. He's also a past president and current member of the Council of the Jamaica Institute of Quantity Surveyors and the Construction Industry Council in Jamaica. Clearly, he's eminently qualified to speak on this topic. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Woodrow Whiteley. Fellow colleagues of the construction industry, and I know we also have persons here from the wider commercial industry with whom we interact, people from the financial sector, people from the state agencies, you know, so we have a wide diversity of persons here, all with an interest in the construction industry. And I am grateful to be able to address an audience such as you this morning on this topic. Right. Tendering is a matter and an area that I am sure pretty much all of us in here have heard of, you know. And it is sometimes, I think, taken for granted because of the perspective in which you hear the name. Because it's, it's, um, I can say for quantity surveyors, one of our main role include the preparation of 
tender documents and in particular the bills of quantities and very often these are used for tendering so most conservators are very familiar with tendering however before we address the matter of tendering which is the level at which most of us address the subject area i would just want to have it that we are on the same perspective in terms of the we are tendering falls in the scheme of things because at the end of the day what we are accustomed to as the tendering process which is primarily standard bid documents or tender documents being sent out by an agency or by a client private or otherwise and contractors who are suitably qualified and are willing to consider taking on the project would, would submit their tenders and that's normally within the context in which most of us address the subject of tendering which is fine which is fine but i just want to for it to be clear that tendering is actually a part of the procurement process so that means the procurement of what we are accustomed to which is in the built environment either some form of building civil work or it could be some plant major plant construction in which we are involved what will happen is that the procurement in which tendering forms a part and i would want us to appreciate it the procurement process starts from the time when that whole project comes up for consideration and it goes through various phases which will now include tendering and construction which is where we are normally involved and then we tend to have a cutoff but we have to also be cognizant that the procurement doesn't stop when we do a final certificate which is what we would normally do to close out a contract but that procurement continues for the life of that facility right so at the end of the day uh we have to know and i'm speaking against the perspective of uh cost professionals and construction economists from that sort of background within which this um process falls we would want to consider now life costs we are past this stage now of just single uh, implementation costs yes so even in terms of our national and our country and even private development we are now at the level of appreciation of life costs life cycle costs and so whatever part of the procurement process we are in I would want us to just bear in mind um, that aspect of it. Going back specifically to tendering now, which is normally within the context of the procuring of, um, in this case, the main contractor for a construction project. From the, the client's perspective, I would say that tendering has some attractive um, results the primary one is that when you tender a project it is at that time that you can be assured of getting what I would consider the most competitive market price right however bear in mind that there are sometimes constraints which will not allow for a project to be tendered and as a result you may end up having to maybe have a negotiated contract you know and at the end of the day when one considers again our overall costs 
then it may be the case that the negotiated contract is the way to go at that point in time. Knowing very well it may not be the lowest or best market price. But as again we have said, tendering and what we are doing is only part of our overall process. So when you look at it that way, then it may at times be beneficial to have what is a higher initial cost. So there, it, it, there are pros and cons for all the various approaches. But from the client's perspective, tendering allows for choosing, putting processes in place so that the contractor selected one is one that has the capability of doing the work and two, the price that is finally accepted can be considered the, the most competitive market price at that point in time. So from that perspective, um, I would say from the client, it is an attractive way to go when you, and, and, and I would su suggest the way to go once you are not constrained. And bear in mind that tendering, even in construction, is that don't have to be limited to just the traditional approach of having um, bills of quantities. Because even in terms of different cost formats, you can still have a way to have a competitive process. You know, you may not have time to do a bill of quantities. The client might decide, let's go at a prime, you know, a prime cost contract. You know, but there is still a way to ensure that one, you get the contractor that is capable, whether you do it as a two-stage, single-stage tendering process. But the key with it is that you put measures in place so that when the contractor who submits the most competitive market price is considered all things being equal, they should be able to be awarded the contract. In terms of the contractors now, you find tendering is important because tendering is a means by which the contractors are able to get business, right? And it is a way in which individual companies can lever their efficiencies and their competitiveness, which is what is always required. However, what I would always ask is that from the contractor's perspective, and this is also necessary from the client's perspective, it is very important that the process is, is seen to be fair, transparent, and equitable. That means when a contractor tenders, that person need to be assured that they stand as fair a chance as anybody else in getting that job. And the person who will get it is based on their overall competitiveness and deserving of it so based on the tendering conditions. It is very important because at the end of the day, it is an expensive process, right? And when contractors take part of, of, of that process, they need to be assured that they stand a fair chance of success. In terms of the instruction to bidders, I'm just running through our list which we have in front of us, is a very comprehensive guide. In terms of the instruction to bidders, my advice to the client would be to make the instruction and the consultants, make the instruction to bidders as clear as possible. Let there be no ambiguity. When you read something, someone shouldn't have to wonder, what does this mean? You need to cut out the ambiguity. You also, in terms of persons putting together bidding documents, and I'm speaking now about the instruction to bidders, because this is the first place that the contractors start falling out. 
Right? When they fall out here, you don't look at the price. Right? I would say avoid what I call pitfalls. These are <laughs> what you call maybe mandatory requirements which at the end of the day are placed in the document in such a way that if you're not careful, the contractor miss it. Right? There's some little thing that says, oh, if you don't put an initial on page 63, you're disqualified. And the person do everything else and never put an initial on page 63. And they're disqualified. So here's the other thing that I would suggest now. And this will help both the people constructing the bidding documents and the contractors who have to use them. You see, all the mandatory requirements, everything that could allow a contractor to fail at the first step, no TCC, boom, you're out. Right? No this, boom, you're out. Right? You see, all those things, when you finish, have them all over the document according to us. So everybody have a way with a structure the document. I am one for uniformity, by the way. I would prefer if everybody do them document the exact same way. So when I pick it up, I know exactly what I'm looking for. People know me from UTEC days. I tell them, anything I do is not my way. It is the standard way. So when I leave here, if I want to live in South Africa, I don't have to modify how I do a final account. I have one way that I do it. It is the standard way. Right? So in terms of the instruction to bidders, what I would suggest is that the client have the consultants and themselves put in a comprehensive matrix of the mandatory requirements in the bidding documents which could cause a contractor to fail. And the contractors know when you are completing your bid, you can use that matrix now as a checkoff. I personally love tables, you know, because I don't like to read more than I have to. You know, so anything normally you're giving me, if it starts to look plenty, I say, can it go in a tabular format or something, some kind of see the main headings and see what you want to see and tick one yes and X no. I prefer that than give me a book to read, you know. So sometimes the documents are so exhaustive that these requirements which are placed all through the different places with no we are to pull them together are one of the first pitfalls. So I would say avoid ambiguity and two is uh, put a comprehensive matrix for all your mandatory requirements. And bidders, contractors, when you're bidding, please pay attention to it. If it says there that whoever signed the bid must be a director, or if it's not a director, they need to have a power of attorney to do so. Please do it. So many people do comprehensive bids. The general manager sign it. He's not a director. It don't come with a, a accompanying um, power of attorney. So that alone, just by looking on your bid surface document, you get thrown out. Bam. Right? So, but a mandatory requirement like that should also be entered on your matrix. The form of contract and responsibilities of the contractor. And I will extend this to say responsibilities of the client too. We don't have much time, so I have to be concise. I'm just creating areas for you to consider. And for those who are interested in specific areas, we can delve into that in the Q&A or you into your own private reading. Where I, everybody, when whatever the contract is, I say to people, Please, if you are a contractor, let us say most of us here are contractors, but also if you are a client, please, please, it seems like I'm saying something crazy now. Please, could you please read the contract? And I would also suggest you read it before you send in the big price. A lot of you will, will, will have the experience, because a lot of us have gray here now, right? Where when you do your bid, and then you may even jump for joy that you are successful, and after you get the job, you see a little clock. I never did read that. 
You mean it's a fixed price and then I sign it. You, you understand? No, after you sign it, <laughs> what you're going to do? Try to opt out? It, you need to read it before. Even before your bid, because you know the bid is fixed price for argument's sake to be practical. And those in office in construction know what fixed price means, right? Y yes. Because if you go to the Oxford, you know, I'm just telling you, I have to deal with it in all these adjudication and these other arbitration and these other contract matters. If you go to the Oxford, look up fixed price, you're getting it wrong. What the Oxford have is fixed. That if I say, I go to school, it's done with a nail and it fixed it. Fixed. That's what the Oxford deal with. In our industry, we have particular meanings that are given to particular words. And we have to be cognizant of that. So, when you go to persons who are not specifically trained in the construction discipline, whether that person be trained in accounting, law, geography, engineering, it don't matter. The key with it is that you have to make sure that the knowledge is there. So when I say fixed price, I have met maybe half of the room size person who have said, oh, you know what fixed price means? It means that the price is fixed. Even if the client tell you to build another two story, the price is fixed. Even if you have to do this, the price is fixed. That's what the job said. And I, and the, the, the cases tick like this, right? But in construction, let me have it very clear, because that don't matter to me, you know. Garbage is garbage. In construction, fixed price simply means that there is no flop allowance for fluctuations. Whenever we see it in the context of construction, fixed price relates to our fluctuation clauses. So if somebody says to you, this is a fixed price contract, the end price cannot change from the contract. So what it means is strictly in relation to fluctuations, it, the, it, the job is not subject. The prices are not subject. So if a contractor have not read that, and they tendered on the basis of current prices. And the client put in the document, bear in mind, I am not awarded until next year this same time. Because I'm writing a document. And next year this time, you know, when you get the job and jump up, you start saying, oh, the dollar is 100, now it's 120. You have to read your contracts properly, please. Right? And when you are... Um, Dealing with any matter under the contract, all your responsibilities under the contract are to be based strictly on the contract terms, not what anybody think or what somebody want to do. At the end of the day, for a contractor, your main responsibility in my mind is to build the client's building within the terms and conditions of the contract. So you have a contract duration. You have specifications, conditions to be met. The client would have employed their professional persons to design possibly and even implement possibly. But at the end of the day, as far as my knowledge goes, the main responsibility of any client is to pay and pay on time. Once you do that, Mr. Client, half the jobs we have problems with will not happen because we don't hear that side of the story. When people hear that this job overrun and the contractor has done so bad and they talk about cost overrun and they use various terms that sound like it made the headlines, nobody says, but do you realize this contractor is consistently paid late? Months not paid and the man is still trying to get the task done because the contract said he don't want to suspend. He has done his commercial assessment, spoken to his lawyers and his QSs. And they said, no, no, don't determine the job, man. You, at the end of the day, you'll be all right. Right? So, at the end of the day, clients, please bear that in mind. 
the main responsibility. So if the contract says payment within 14 days or 21 days or 28 days of the payment certificate being presented, please bear in mind one of the key to the success of any construction project is the payment of the contractors on time. Joints and specifications. Once you have a job that is supposed to have been a designed contract, because contracts can range from contracts that are fully designed on behalf of the client and the contractor simply bills, you can have jobs that are partially designed and where the contractor has an input in some aspects of it. And there are also jobs like the straight design and build where the design will ultimately come from the contractor's camp, right? Naturally, the client can have their way of dictating how you go about the design, but the, with a design and build contract, it ultimately ends up with the contractor. Whichever approach is done and whoever does the design, it doesn't matter. The design needs to be complete, right? It needs to be complete and in a sense, which is not normally at the tendering stage, but the consultants need to ensure that it accurately reflects the client's brief. One of the problems why you have variations is because the client will walk on and say, oh, but, I mean, didn't I not tell you that every room needs to have an office attached? And he said, oh, I, I, I missed that point. But it's very relevant when you come in the middle of construction, which is when the client sees it. When you start paint walls, he said, where are the offices? And then you start having a spew of variations involving plumbing, electrical, tearing up some tiles, tearing up floor, tearing up a lot of new work. So it's very important and it's also very expensive. I am speaking to the more knowledgeable of us, the contractors, who have their commercial flexibility when it comes to you wanting something at the last minute. And the price that they gave you last year really don't seem to apply because you want it done at midnight. So again, they get a good QS and oh boy. So you don't want that situation. So you want a good comprehensive client's brief and you want your design ideally to be as complete as possible. Once the designs are complete, there are various risks in construction, you know. But what if a project goes into the field with, with proper, complete design, that by itself eliminates a whole range of risk related to construction projects. Very often, the design is not complete, not because the time is not there, but because the appreciation is not there for the need and effectiveness of that process. There are persons and clients and consultants who sometimes say, for example, let's not bother with a geotechnical. Those guys are a little expensive. You know, I, I don't think anything will happen, you know? And you find out that the eight foot or 20 foot deep foundations are gonna stand in mid ear because where them reach is a cavity in the ground, is either a cave or a riverbed. All of that would have been saved by doing a geotechnical survey. And if it's not geotechnical survey not done, and this is discovered after the job is in the field, I can tell you the financial consequences will make the cost of the geotech survey look like peanuts. So what I'm saying, I'm not saying a client must do a geotechnical survey, and I'm using this as a technical example only. I'm not saying a client must do a geotechnical survey for every job, but you have to consider the risk. So you must know you are taking a risk if you do not do it. So when the project goes in the field and the contractor calls an emergency meeting and says, Mr. Client, Mr. Consultant, we have a problem, then when the contractor says he has to take the foundations down another 30 feet and the job foundation is going to double, then it's not the contractor's fault. So I say drawings and specifications have to also be assisted by you have to research like your geotechnical surveys. But that should be as complete as possible before you get your project even to tendering. Because remember, the clients cannot invent details, you know. 
So you want to get it there so the design, proper design ends up in your contract. And that way you can have a job that is completed to budget. Site inspection, let's say we just spoke about that just now. Pricing of preliminaries, critical, right? At the end of the day, preliminaries are real items. As a matter of fact, I tend not to use the term preliminaries very often. I tend to use the term site overheads, right? In my opinion, there are two types of overheads on pretty much all construction projects. I'm speaking to primarily main contractors here, right? Um, you have your head office overheads and you have your site overheads. Your site overheads, I would define as items which are absolutely necessary on site for the efficient management of your site. But the items are not related to any one or specific item of work. <clears throat> so, for example, your, your security and watching, your insurances, your major plant and equipment. You know, you may, for example, have a tower crane on site and you decide the best place to put that is in the preliminaries because at the end of the day, you're using the tower crane from ground to top. Every trade is going to benefit from this tower crane, right? So, the preliminaries is very important. There are some times when the preliminaries are not priced. Now, please bear in mind that it is better to have the preliminaries fully priced. It helps with the process of transparency. And remember, with quantity surveyors, you will understand we have a particular role to play. And when we talk about the bills of quantities, this is where we ask for all items of work to be broken down. And the, by the way, as I said before, if that won't be broken down, or would we likely want it, you know? No, 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 no. We have national documents, such as the Jamaican Standard Method of Measurement, which is primarily used locally for measurement of building works. And we have international documents because in our local case, the civil engineering standard method of measurement produced by the ICE is what is primarily used in Jamaica for the measurement of civil engineering works. These, were, these documents indicate how items are to be measured and described. So if one were to choose, for example, the preliminaries, to think that you have an advantage of not disclosing it. I am saying to you, I am not aware of ever being aware of anyone gaining advantage, at least not with me, for not disclosing it. Because as a QS, we have the methods to evaluate anything that relates to any cost in the contract, whether you put a price against it or not. However, what happens is that when you are sometimes bidding and the price is not disclosed for the prelims at all or not broken down, it sometimes becomes an issue, right? Because sometimes bidders will get the feedback where the client says, you are the lowest, but you are so low, I do not think I can give you that project. And on top of that, your prelims is not priced. So the document naturally prepared by a good QS would say whether your price or item or not, it, your price include everything in this document and inside that document would more than likely be a requirement for all the necessary preliminary items and other requirements. So when the client says to you now, right to you during the tender evaluation process, your bid is being considered, but we are concerned your price appears too low. How can you justify it? If you write back and say, oh, I live next door, so I don't need to have any prelims, and send that back in, you are not getting that job. Because the benefits of li living next door only impact some and very few items of your preliminaries. Right? So, 
whenever, and that's an interesting point, whenever a client write back and say your bid is low, if you believe you can genuinely do it, you cannot just write back and say, look here, I can do it for that price, I own a hardware, buy. No, not good enough. You have to be specific. If you own the mixer, you're not charging for the rental, but you're only charging for the, the fuel and the, the, the driver, etc. You need to say so. You have to be, be very specific so the client can be convinced. If you have some old steel children five years ago, that's why your price is for 10 pounds, not pound. Say so. Regulatory requirements. Those are necessary. The, the preparation of the documents. See to it that we cover all the regulatory requirements, please. Some agency might be hard to get harder to get than others, but we have to see that we do it. Right? We need to get maybe some easier way to get into the GEI people. So sometimes we can't get to them. But we have to find a way to ensure that all our and especially now that we have in our building code, right? Because we have the building act and we have the regulations which are now going through. All of you know about the implications for quantity surveyors, but today is not the forum for that, right? And you will judge for yourself after today whether quantity surveyors are required in this industry or not, and whether we are professionals or not. You will judge that, not me. Schedule of works critical. Please, contractors especially, when you're preparing the schedule of works, don't take it lightly. Very often it is taken lightly and it is done in a manner just showing a start date, an end date, and everything that happened in between doesn't make sense. Please see, it's a very critical document. Also, keep it on site. It's not only needed for the client to have in their files. It is needed for your people on site to help in managing the project. So it is critical that they show you. I don't think enough um, significance is given to the preparation of work schedules, and I'm asking that you please bear that in mind. Also, do it in a form so that you can identify your critical parts, because those become important, especially if you have to claim for extension of time. Most uh, were all related to the non-compliance with the within documents and normally there is an instruction when there is a bidding document it is recommended that there is a specific section which is normally labeled instructions to bidders that is the area that indicates the specific requirements for 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 for, for the persons who are our entities who are tendering. What you should also look out for, depending on how the documents are formatted, it might either be included in the same section or in a subsequent section, a document referred to as um, instructions, not instruction to builders, bidding data. And the bidding data would normally indicate, especially if the instructions reflect a standard document, which is very often the case, especially if you're bidding on government type projects where there are standard bidding documents which are produced um, for the purposes of um, bidding. So the bidding data is very important, especially in documents such as those, because the bidding data is where you find the specifics now for the bid that you are now providing. So, for example, not providing a bond, right? I have seen where it requires a bid bond and the, the, the contractor did not send it in. One of them I spoke to, he said to me, oh, I never thought about it because through the job, I think it was going to come to less than X figure. And I think for those figures, normally they don't ask for bond. But he didn't read the document that asked for a tender bond. Um, and on the subject of bonds, we are going to have a discussion coming on for bonds 
I'm not going to claim that, but one of the major pitfalls I have found have generally to do with the provision of the bonds in accordance with the tender documents, right? So you, you need to make sure that the bond is obtained from somewhere authorized to issue that bond, and two, that the wording of the bond match or is, you know, with the standard wording, deviations from the, 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 the requirements. You also have pitfalls where the bidding data might indicate a contractor is simply to indicate his history of projects over the last five years. And something as obvious as that is not filled in. Right? So, again, the matrix. Right? But most of the pitfalls, I would say, relate to bonds, um, persons not signed, authorized persons not signing the, the, the tender sheet, the bid. Bid, you know, that the sheet, form of, the, form of bid. the form of bid, right? It must be director or, you know, so those are some of the major pitfalls, I would say. Thank you, Mr. Whiteley. Um, the floor is now open. In terms of bonus or uh, unusual requirements, I, I didn't want to touch on that because I was taking it to be an extension of what I spoke about earlier dealing with generally under the headings of pitfalls. But what you may have are requirements. When you say onerous or unusual, these I would regard as requirements which are over and above what could be considered reasonable for a job of that nature in terms of being able to participate and Naturally, unusual would be, I would take it as the term says, unusual requirement, a requirement that is not normally asked for and maybe one that could not easily be met unless one became exposed to some specific narrow area. Now, the consequence of these are that a lot of possible interested tenderers will not be able to meet those onerous and or unusual requirements. And by virtue of that, you will end up maybe having very few persons or entities eligible to tender, if any at all. Uh, what was the question? How do you deal with as a bidder? Well, as the bidder, as the bidder, that is why I said to you it's critical that you read the contract and read the entire bidding document. Because if you find it has in requirements which you consider onerous or unusual and makes it one that you do not believe that you'll be able to provide a competitive bid, then my first suggestion would be maybe decide not to bid. That means you don't bother e e incur the expense and time and effort of bidding when you know from the outset that there are some requirements that you are just not able to meet. Now, if it is a case that it is private projects, maybe one could look at that one way because a private person are pretty much free to profile my bid requirement any way I want. But if it is a public using public money, state entity, public money, then I believe that any such affected likely bidder should be able to make some sort of a complaint or representation to say a whole wide section of us can't bid because based on this one requirement, only one man in Jamaica can bid, right? And you make your representation and you have a strong enough body to do that. So that's the sort of approach that I would suggest. That is good for public, but for private, naturally, the private person doesn't have to meet that level, same level of scrutiny. But for public, I believe all bids should be not have onerous, not have highly unusual, so that all bidders who are qualified and capable should be able to submit a bid if they consider that decision to be to their benefit. Thank you, Mr. Whiteley. 
Okay, morning, Sir Finley. All right. Um, we spoke. Uh, we spoke. We touched on that uh, a little earlier. Now, just for those of us to bring all of us into the loop, Mr. Finley's question is against the background that in the government of Jamaica's procurement guidelines, there is a requirement for in the bid evaluation process bids which are maybe 15 percent more than 15 percent higher than the estimate of the procurement or more than 15 percent lower those bids are could possibly be rejected as being out of range and therefore if it's too high, you don't want to issue contract too high. If it's too low, you are concerned bidder may not be able to perform, so you still don't want to issue it too low. However, please bear in mind that that 15% figure is really a guide, not a hard and fast rule. It is a guide. That is why you need your consultant, you need your professionals, who are highly skilled in costs and who can give you their professional judgment, right? For example, you may have a bid that is 25% below your estimate. However, it's not just that it's 25% below your estimate. I believe it's also significant for you to look at the profile of all the bids you have received. Now suppose all the bids you receive are below your estimate. Yes? Can I? You don't have to say what happened, right? So, what you have to do if that is the case is not throw it out and say it is below your estimate. What you have to do is just be man or be woman and say, I made a little error. My bid estimate obviously is high based on the bids spread from 22 to 25, my price is at 30 or 35. In my estimation, if all the bidders bid 25 and 30 percent below me, and all of these are IMAJ contractors, skilled people, you know, it more than likely is, is, a, is an estimate that's out. Yes, and that could be so if the prices are way below or way above. But outside of that wide disparity, Bear in mind, you may have a bidder 20% below, your estimate is correct, seem to be correct, but the US is 20% below. You go to the bidder, he gives you his justification. He tell you, I live next door, so I will stay up at night and be watching. That's why I don't price that item. You can't tell him no. So, all right? Even with that, you don't need price that, right? And he say, I own the trucks, so... All that mall is why it's half price. Now, once we understand the costs are aggregate, all of us know say, most of the cost is in trucking. So if you own the trucks and you really just need to generate cash flow, keep your staff running, pay the bank them overdraft, then you might decide to go in another job where your three trucks are assigned to the project and you're just charging the reimbursable expenses. You have to pay off for them on the last look at your job. So, but, but all of this can be shown, you know, but you cannot just make wide statements to say, I own hardware, because at the end of the day, it don't matter if you own hardware, we all buy cement from Caribe cement. <laughs> all, the, all the WPP is imported, yes? So at the end of the day, there is a bottom price, right? And no hardware, not giving you 30% off on WPP. And you know, as I say, WPP, I was speaking about the electrical people, but the WPP. So I'm just saying, once the contractor can justify, then I don't see a problem with it if it's even outside of the 15% range. All right, um, let me try and be quick. I know Mr. Moore needs us to move on. All right, in terms of the time for the return of tender documents, and you made reference to a two-week period. Um, my, 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 uh, my opinion is that for what I would tend to refer to, and I'm talking now specifically con tendering for construction projects. For simple, straightforward projects, I would say two weeks is reasonable. However, for projects which are much more involved, which are more involved, 
then two weeks may not be reasonable. Right? And the reason why I, why I say so, for what I call simple projects, I refer to those, not necessarily just in terms of money, because you could have a hundred million simple project, you know, right? Because if I ask you to be a warehouse and it's just black wall and sheeting going from here to half a tree, that is a simple project, right? However, if I ask you to do a project with all kind of specialty design items, very often for a contractor to get those items priced properly, they have to go through a very time-consuming process. It includes shortlisting possible subcontractors or suppliers, which sometimes that by itself takes time. And then when they do shortlist these people, some might be local, some might be overseas, then you have the situation of them getting a turnaround. Remember the subcontractor now who is asked to price the specialty item. This job is not on his radar. Your tender time frame, unless you have entertained him before at some hotel and in our course, don't necessarily fall at the top of his pile. And if you call him three times for the day, he might decide you somebody need to stop calling him. Right? So we have all the different profiles. All of us know how we operate in the industry. Because we are under, we are under pressure. Why is this man calling me? I don't have time to price no speculative thing. Oh, tell you what, the last time, oh, if he keeps calling, secretary, tell him. I think the last one we did last year was 250,000. Things should have gone up a little, but tell him 500,000 if he call back, right? How before? <laughs> So you don't want that. So in terms of time too short, we have to make the time realistic based on the nature or complexity of the project. So I would say two weeks reasonable for simple projects. You can even be less than two weeks, depending what you're doing too, right? But for most projects which are involved, then especially in terms of what is involved in the design elements and the pricing of those design elements. To me, those are the main considerations. Um, and then naturally the volume of the document, right? So it, you see, you put in the matrix, it saved the boss 10 hours of reading, you know? Because you have to read 100 pages to find out the mandatory requirements. You find it out five minutes on one summary page. So I'll have to um, speed it up and if you know some more tips, if somebody is leaving two weeks, right? As against taking two weeks just to read and find the mandatory requirements. So time should be based on the type of project. In terms of time for completion and, it, and its reality, a bidding contractor, a tender, a potential tender, remember you have read the document, you could choose not to bid. If you feel the time is unrealistic to you, it may not be unrealistic to another person. So I, my suggestion would be, you may consider not to bid. You also have commercial considerations. So the client might say, okay, this is the time period. When you do, remember the schedule we talk about, and you do all the activities working 24 hours, you find that this 15 month job really needs 17 months. You cannot crank it any further. So when you look in the document, you say, look here, I'm not backing down yet. You look in the document, you realize it tell you, if you run yet, one million dollar deal, liquidated damages. So you have two choices. One, you run away, you don't get involved. Or two, you add up your figures and you get $20. And you say, I will run 60 day over, one million dollar a day, 60 million, plus liquor risk if never got through that 70 million if they want to give it the work. Bam! So in other words, it may not be to the client's benefit to put in an unrealistic time. It could lead to inflated bids. So if we can remember when you're pricing your bid, you know, you have to look at all the risk elements. We're not going to get into that now, because that's our world next two, ten hours. But when you identify the risk. You know, and that could be one of your risk, the risk of overrun based on the contract duration, and you can just price it. That would be my suggestion, either price it or run away. Okay, so he spoke about risk. And so it leads us smoothly into talking about bonds and insurances, because that's what those are.
aimed at. And to do that, I have Miss Sharon Donaldson, who is the Managing Director of General Accident Insurance Company. She has been with the company for over 20 years and is primarily responsible for, the dri for driving its recent growth in underwriting and profits and its traditional strong relationship with local industry and international reinsurers. Sharon is also a director of Mosson Jamaica Limited, the parent company to General Accident, Epley Limited, and Stanley Motor Limited. She serves as a director and mentor of 138 Student Living Limited, Jamaica Environmental Trust, and Paramount Trading Jamaica Limited. She's also a member of the Jamaica Anti-Doping Commission and Jamaica Environment Trust. Ms. Donaldson holds the position of treasurer on the Council of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Jamaica and heads the Committee of Professional Accountants in Business. She holds an LLB from the University of London, England and an MBA from the University of Wales. She's a chartered accountant, a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Jamaica and an attorney at law. A proud graduate of Rossi's High School, close by, and the current president of the Rossi's Old Students Association, Past Students Association, yes. Ms. Donaldson's capabilities can be measured in her ability to prepare business plans to reinsurers leading to increased underwriting capacity and market share. She was instrumental in the restructuring of the underwriting units that in turn has produced improved functionalities and greater value-added services. She was integral in guiding the process of the company being listed on the Junior Stock Exchange in Jamaica. Through innovation and strategic planning, she would redefine the terms and conditions of the company's main policies to provide enhanced values to insureds without increasing the company's risk exposure. And she does other things as well. Among all of that. Interestingly, she, with all her current responsibilities, Mrs. Miss Donaldson, and, and she's actually married finds time to read, enjoys watching netball, I suppose the NHT winning all of those trophies and so on, tennis and dramatic theater. She's married to Junior Levine, the mother of one daughter and a proud grandmother of a beautiful granddaughter. She's well versed in the area of bonds and insurances in support of the con construction industry. I got a little snippet of the presentation, and I tell you, you will be wowed again. So without further ado, Miss Donaldson. Thank you so very much for that very kind introduction. I looked around for a moment and wondered who was he talking about? And when you listen to that, it appears as if all I've done is gone to school, don't it? All over the place. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I do like learning. I'm not sure that I am the person that you want to see today. And the reason why I say that is because um, insurance is the last thing that you want to buy. And generally speaking, you only buy it if you are forced to purchase it. That's true, right? Um, so let's not even pretend that this is a well-coveted product or service that you need. However, I am here to tell you today that this is the first thing that you actually need. Even though it is the last thing, the first thing or the last thing that you would want to purchase. We do have some issues with the insurance industry, and I like to put them on the table. And the first one is that you don't trust us. That's absolutely true, right? 
Um, you consider, generally speaking, in Jamaican language, we thief, very thief. We try to sell you something that you don't understand. And mostly the product that we sell is generally misunderstood. And the reason for that is because most purchasers of insurance think that they have bought an investment policy rather than an insurance policy. The investment policy has a certainty of outcome. The insurance policy does not. So there's a slight difference between the two. Anyway, hopefully today, I can reverse that opinion. And when you leave here, you will have a little bit more faith in the persons who sell you this insurance. First of all, we're just normal people like you. We go to the same churches that you do, praise the same God if we do praise one, and supposed to make sure that what we sell you, we sell you something that is in your best interest. So I want you to start that way. She's shaking her head. She says, no, I don't trust you people. <laughs> anyway, today I hope that at the end of it, you will at least half trust us. So if you half trust us, then we're on our way to winning. Okay? We don't thief. In truth and in fact, we don't thief. And maybe most importantly, we do need you. And another important little fact is that you need us. Because I, th I think together, we can do a nice dance, and at the end of it, everybody can be happy going home. The world is demanding certainty of performance, and that's what we provide for you. A little bit of certainty of performance. So this is what it is about. That's what bond insurance is about. It is a partial solution to the certainty of performance that the principal and Mr. Whiteley, who I think has a rather hubristic name, it says Woodrow Whiteley. Yeah, that's a British name, isn't it? Very, very British, right? So basically, we're trying to give you a half solution to what is required of you. And the other half solution is based on your own character and performance. That's basically what it is. It is about character and performance. And I listen to him. He says that if you can't do the job in five days, then don't go bid for doing it in four and a half. Because at the end of it, you will not be able to meet that performance. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to call your performance bond. And I will have no choice but to pay. But guess what? And I'm going to come to that in a little while. Your bond is secured by your most precious asset. And guess what I'm going to do with that most precious asset? I'm going to sell it and convert it. So... It is about your character, and it's about me and you going to the dance together. We're going to do this walls well, because if we do this walls well, at the end of it, I'll be happy, and you will be happy, and your security that you've pledged for this bond will be safe. But before we get into that, let's just talk a little bit about some education and what bonds is and should be. That's small. Anybody can see that? Have I turned this off? No? Can you? On either side. Oh, by the way, I want to say that I quickly count, being half a contact, I quickly count in this room, and I think that we have about 30 women in here. I wasn't expecting to see so many, so I'm asking, is that the women in here? They're all contractors? You're contractors? No? Architects. You're architects. Ah, okay. Right. Because I was wondering if we are conquering that world too. You know, soon, soon, right? Okay, good. All right. So... In fact, what is a bond? Oh, yeah, go back. Oh, yeah. Bonds, yes. A bond is a legally binding contract that ensures obligations will be met between three parties. And the three parties are the principal, that is the contractor, that's you being the principal, the obligee, that is the government entity who acts for on the contract. Oh, let me not say that. All right? And the surety, that is us, the insurance company. So, in truth and fact, this is a three-party relationship, not just wife and husband. Wife and husband are meeting, right? Three-party relationships. So we have the principal, we have the obligee, and we have the surety. 
And we need to make sure that we protect the interest of all three. So we're gonna have to juggle some balls, right? Okay, next slide, please. So type of bonds that we have, no pun intended, right? Um, we have the big bond and the tender bond. And that's a nice, easy little one. The big bond is issued to the principal as part of the bidding process to guarantee the contractor's willingness and ability to contract under the terms on which they bid. Nice and easy as an insurance company, we require no collateral for the big bond. It's very tiny sum. Then we come to the real biggies, and that is, apart from the bid and tender bonds, we're gonna to go to the mobilization bond. The mobilization bond, you are quite aware of what it is, what it does, it protects you for the advance money that has been given to you to start the work. And if you do not complete the work, if you do not use the funds, then you are in fact supposed to give the money back. If you don't have the money to give back, then the insurance company that has provided the insurance for the mobilization will cough up the money and give it back on your behalf. But if we do that, then we take your asset. And finally, the performance bond. And this is where the real character comes in. And the performance bond guarantees that the contract will be satisfactorily executed to the detailed specification laid out in the contract or agreement between the contracting parties. So this is where the real test of performance is. Will you be able to deliver the completed building in time in accordance with the standard that is required of you? If you don't, then again, the, um, the OBG will ask for the performance bond to pay out. Uh, and I come to a very pet peeve of mine, the wording of the bonds. This is the best opportunity to define the exposure of the parties and impact the cost. And you said something, Mr. Wheatley, that is very important. You, Whiteley, sorry. It's you started, you know. Yeah. Um, you said something about the fact that um, if you put in unreasonable um, terms and conditions, it is likely to push the cost of the bond, the, the contract up. And in truth and in fact, if you do wordings that are very onerous, it will push the cost of the performance bond up. It will. So sometimes it's important for you to pay attention to the wording to make sure that it is in everyone's best interest. Bond wordings. We have two types. One is called a demand bond, and that is where it basically says to the contractor, if me, the government entity, says that you are in default, then you are in default. So you don't get a chance to, say, to defend it to say that you're not in default. It basically says that I, the government entity, who you're working for, building for says that you are in default, then you are in default. And if you are in default, they simply need to write me, the insurance company, and say, the person is in default. Please send me the bond money, 15, 20, 30 million. Contractors come and says, but no, Ms. Donaldson, you can't do that because the work is three quarter complete and really, really, it's only two million left to be done, da, 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 da. Tough. The bond that you have signed basically says that if the entity says you are in default, you are in default. There's nothing you can do about it. I will have no choice under the law but to pay out the bond and to take your asset and convert it. You don't like them bond word in there. I prefer the second one. The second bond wording is a little kinder to you and all parties. It basically says that we do guarantee, but both the contractor and ourselves are given an opportunity to review the work that has been done, evaluate what is left to be done, and then your bond would only respond with paying out for the difference. And we have a couple of options. It could be one, we would complete the contract, we could just pay the difference. So that is the bad wording that is in your best interest. 
and everyone else's best interests. But sometimes from the government's point of view, it's not in their best interest. Don't just say you're in default and you're in default. And once you're in default, the whole 15 million is paid over to them, even though you may only have 2 million left on the contract to be done. So that bond wording, and it depends on who asked for it and why. Okay? Now, how does that affect your insurance? If it is the first one, then I want 150% collateral because I have no choice to defend it. I have no option. I can't defend it. But if it is the other bond wording, then I can make the collateral a little less onerous. So availability of a collateral. Um, the performance and mobilization bonds require the contractor to place 10% of the contract value upfront as a bond. And, and as, it most, as it gets more restrictive, restrictive, it costs more. The restriction, of, the restriction of cash collateral can impair the operation and prevent smaller contractors with the skill set from competing bidding on projects. Because if you have to provide 100% collateral in cash, it means your cash is tied up for the term of the contract. That's true, don't it? So it means that if you have 20 million as a collateral, it means you can't touch that 20 million until the contract is done. The insurance relationship offers greater flexibility. It offers flexibility. Because depending on your relationship with us, the trust that we have in each other, your character, your performance history, we can vary the amount of collateral that we ask for. So your factors affecting the cost and the availability of the bonds, um, your competence, your good character. Um, you should be aware that the inability to complete a project with the within the contracted timeline can be construed as a breach that can cause the bond to be called, and we've already talked about that. So what are the four steps in getting a bond? The three Cs. We need to be assured that you have adequate capital to support the project, that you have a capacity to be able to develop the project, and that you have the character to be able to develop, de deliver the project in accordance with the terms of your contract document. We would want audited financial statement for the last two years, your fi last five recent contract, information on your last experience, the list of your directors, and valid tax compliance certificates. I know everybody now asks a valid tax compliance certificate, right? Yeah, you see, one wonder if I'm a tax collecting agent. Um, if is this a one-off request or some of the things that we're looking at? Do you need a standby facility to allow your company to bid on projects? What type and amount of collateral do you have available? Are there multiple projects in your horizon that can be covered by your available collateral. These are just some of the things that you have to look at when you've decided to put in a bid. So what do you need to do? You need to look at the, the, the security that you have, your real estate, whether it is unencumbered or encumbered. Real estate must be insured and we would want our interest noted on the real estate. If you are not the sole owner, the property may still be used as a security. However, all owners must give written permission. And sometimes what I find, and I've had, I, have, I can give you many sad stories where a friend is doing a project. He doesn't have any security to pledge. So he goes to his best friend from high school days who has a piece of, nice piece of land somewhere in upscale Jamaica, and he says, can I borrow your title to pledge? And the friend says, yes, here it is. Go to the insurance company. The insurance company says, I need permission from the friend. 
and the friend duly writes a letter and says that you can use this asset as security. Contract not completed according to terms. Bond is called. Money is paid out by the insurance company and I'm not ready to convert the security to cash. And then the poor friend turns up and says, Ms. Nana, so please don't do that. That was not my intention. I did just really give it to him to help him out. What can you do to help me? Do you really have to sell this asset? This is where I'm going to build my dream home. Too late. We need permission from everyone who is giving up their security. So it's something to understand. If you have... If you can give me cash, it would be much better. But as I said, it is likely to put you, uh, your liquidity in issue. We would want a high prothecation letter um, to say that in the event that we have to pay out, we'll ask the bank to pay us the cash instead. We would hold the letter. Um, you could give us motor vehicle and equipment, um, but those motor vehicles and equipment must have no lien. Um, they must be insured and we will do a bill of sale, which we will hold and will only execute if we have to. Once the bond collateral is in place, we will give you your bond within 24 hours. Now, our facility, once I've said that, the contractor should know um, you can read that a little bigger. I can hardly read it from here. Should ensure that the costs are included in your construction costs. Finally, in, in deciding to bid for a contract, you should budget a figure in for the cost of the bond. The cost of the bond will be the premium, i.e. somewhere from a low of 2% to a high of 4%. And depending on the level of security that you've provided in addition to the legal cost to register the insurance company's interest on your asset. So if it is if it is cash, it's going to be cheaper. If it is real estate, it's going to be a little bit more expensive. But we can work with you to make sure that we provide you with the pricing before so that when you're doing your bid documents, you include it in the cost. I would suggest proper budgeting needs to be done. And very quickly, I know you want to talk about bonds more than anything else. I'm going to get all the questions coming at me, at you, at me, but I just want to talk about the contractor's always policy. So now you've been awarded the contract and you have started construction, you can also get a little sleep at night easy if you take out a contractor's all risk policy. As the name suggested, it covers all risks that you are likely to encounter on your site. Loss or damage to property for any reason, that's why it's, called, it's all risk. Um, fire, flood, windstorm, contractors plant and equipment, um, clearance of, of, of debris, um, consulting fees. Um, it can also cover, provide you with some public liability cover. So accidental bodily injury and illness to any persons, excluding your employees, because your employees are not public. So if someone comes on your property and they fell down or they weren't wearing their hat and something fell on their head and they're injured, the public liability policy will chip in and cover the claims for you. And it also covers employee liability. Um, employer's liability, which will cover your employees within the company, um, we provide compensation for costs for which you are found legally liable when an employee is injured during the employment. Here is a big exposure that you guys don't pay attention to. You have subcontractors. And there is a thin line between you, the main contractor, and the subcontractor particularly their employees. So this person who fell off a ladder, 
Is he your employee? Is or is he the subcontractor's employee? Because you don't do everything. You maybe get a subcontractor to do the carpentry work, but you did not ask the subcontractor if they had insurance. You should ask them if they have insurance. If they don't have insurance, then you need to extend your policy to include coverage for them. So again, since we work in an insurance company, we've seen many tears. Even though people call us teeth, you know, including the fact when I'm in trouble, I'm combaling. So here, this gentleman in Montego Bay, just about four months ago, has a big project in Montego Bay, has a subcontractor. His subcontractor employee went upon a ladder to take something down without proper scaffolding and everything, fell off the ladder, and sadly to say, died. So the main contractor came to me to say that, does it cover his subcontractor? No, because his policy was extended to include subcontractor. Did the subcontractor have insurance? No, but the families of the deceased man is angry, don't it? They're going to take him to court. They're going to take the subcontractor and the contractor, main contractor to court. And since we don't have no welfare system in Jamaica, judges are not inclined not to provide massive compensation. They are, in fact, I hope no judges are in here. I don't like them. Because they award big claims against insurance companies, right? So here's this gentleman in front of me saying, Ms. Donaldson, what am I going to do? I said, the only thing I can ask you to do is pray. It's nothing I can do to help you. I can't pay a policy for a claim that's not covered. I can maybe give you a teeny weeny ex gratia, but there's nothing against what the family is going to ask of you. Because you're going to go to Twitter and tell him the man is young, he have three children, they're in high school, they need to go to university, there's a wife, and all this loss of income, loss of future earnings, and all of that, you're going to have to pay it. So I think you need to go talk to the family and see if you can get them to be reasonable. Just basically what he did, and they were, in fact, somewhat reasonable. But that is still out of the courts, because you can't win that one. So when you get your, your bonds and you get subcontractors, please remember to ask them, do you have insurance to cover your employees you're bringing on site? If you do not have them, then please ask the insurance company to extend your bond to cover them, and yes, pay the premium for it. It is going to be cheap at the price of you having to pay a claim. So don't quarrel too much about the premium. Yeah? Yeah, that's not like me trying to sell you, don't? So you have to ask yourself some questions. Do I purchase per aggregate coverage or per location across multiple projects? And are my aggregate limits enough? For long-term projects, how will my policy treat my multiple losses? These are all questions you need to ask us. How do my contracts with my subcontractor speaks to my subcontractor speaks to their ability, insurance, and risk management? Do I require my subcontractors to carry coverage? Yes. Have I considered my professional liability exposure? And have I considered my directors and officers exposure? because they too can be asked to cough up some money. So, risk management and claims. Please properly train your staff and enforce strict safety standards of conduct. It is in your best interest if your staff wears the correct safety gears and something drop on their head and they're injured, the insurance company cannot wiggle out of the claim. But if your staff is not wearing the property safety gear, then it is a breach of your insurance contract. And depending on how I wake up in the morning, I may decide not to pay. Because you have breached your contract. So you have to ensure that your staff Wears the property safety gear. Ensure that the site is adequately lit and has property security. Ensure that staff and subcontractors always, we said that already, wear the appropriate safety equipment. Um, have in place a document, documented 
incident handling and reporting procedure. What happens when someone buck them toe on a piece of wood? Someone must write down what the procedure, what you do. Come off the site, go to where the first aid kit is, get a band-aid and put it over the toe. Yeah? All of that are just simple things that you can do to make sure that your insurance contract stays in place. Overly aggressive, unrealistic project timelines. I've heard it and I'm saying it again. When you do that, you put your security at risk because your bond will be called and you cannot afford to have over unrealistic project timelines. When you think that there's going to be a claim, no matter how small it is, call me. Please do. Call us quickly to say that something happened on the site. Can someone come down there? That's what you pay us for. We will come to the site. We'll send some one of our staff to the site that can help you through the claims process. Don't tell me 40 days after. Oh, well, by the way, in terms of claims reporting, you have 30 days to report any claim. If you tell me on day 31, the claim is out. Again, I don't have to pay. You better smile nicely before I decide to pay it, if you tell me on day 31. So I'm your best partner in this business. When something happens, call your insurance company, please. Document as many facts as you can at the time of the accident. Note any witnesses to the accident and get their name. Preserve the scene until we, are, we arrive. And these days, do me a beg you, take a picture. Please take a picture. It is a thousand words. So that we can see exactly what happened so you are not at unusual risk or onerous risk. Just take a picture. So I want to tell you, so I'm going to go back to the very beginning where, you, where I say that you don't like me because you don't trust me because I'm a thief. And I want to go back to say to you that I'm your best friend. I really am. But we have to do the dance together. You have to let me know what the issues are. We will design the best policy for you to help you. You will pay the premium, but the premiums that you pay is part of the cost of your contract. So don't look at it to say that it is money out of your pocket. If you pay an extra 500000 for your insurance, it is because that 500000 will protect your profit of $5 million. Now, 500000 of $5 million is less than one percent so you do not need to worry about the premium you must see the bigger picture which is to protect the profit under the contract of roughly 10 15 20 million dollars particularly when you have billion dollars contract when i look at some of those contract terms wow it looks like the problem is going to be plenty money so pay the right premium to get the correct policy Trust your insurance company. They're normal people just like you. They just want you to sit in front of them and tell them what is happening. And we will provide you with the right coverage. General Accident is prepared to work with your association on all of you to try and see if we can get every one of you that has a contract to get the proper insurance. We will vary the security depending on character, performance, relationship, and trust. Sound good, right? Convincing? Good. It is in fact true. We have an open door policy and you can call me anytime, call any of my underwriters anytime. Nobody will tell you that you have to make an appointment to see me because my success at general accident is totally dependent on satisfaction to all my insurers. So I'm available and accessible. If you want me to come to the site, I will. You just need to provide me with a hard hat and I'll turn up. And big boots, I have to have big boots too? Yes? Okay, all right. And vests, right? I'll turn up, just tell me and I will get a day to dress down. <laughs> Oh, if your security is, let us say, for example, 20 million, and your bond was only 5 million, then we would take our 5 million and give you 50 million.
So you, you would get, no, we don't do that. You would get exactly what, because generally the security is a little bit more than the value of the bond. Yeah, so you get the difference. And we would expect you to get an attorney to have a watching brief, because we will have an attorney doing a watching brief. So your attorney will, you pay them a little fee, but they will protect your interest to make sure that um, you know you get what's rightly yours. So I would have to have a look at the bond wording in the other jurisdiction to see if it is as onerous as the bond wording in Jamaica. Please understand that when you have a demand bond where the, let me just pick an entity, NHT for example has given you a contract and the NHT gives you a bond to sign to say that if I say you are in default, you are in default. Yes, but so, so that must come, that means the insurance company has no opportunity to assess the value of the loss. When I have an opportunity to assess the value of the loss, then the price I charge for it can be less. Agreed. I agree. We're not saying no. We have had contractors who we've been working with for 30, 20, 15 years. That gets a bond with zero collateral. I am not saying that it cannot happen. It can happen. Certainly with general accident, it can. But we have to develop a relationship and you're going to have to prove that you can deliver on time, will deliver on time, will not have any performance issue, will stay to work with us. And yes, we can bear the collateral. We do. We absolutely do. And I don't know if he's here today, but we've had contractors where we have varied the collateral. It depends on the performance and the history and the relationship. But I want to kick back something to you because you're in a position of influence. I don't think that it is right for the government entity to demand, to request a demand bond. I think it is almost, sorry if any one of you in here can probably shoot me afterwards, I think it's almost immoral for you to say to a contractor who has worked very hard, completed the contract to 90%, has only one million left to be done and demand the entire $15 million. That's not right. That's wrong. In my mind, that's wrong. The, the the, the, the government entity should go to the bond wording that says that give everyone an opportunity to finish the contract or compensate me for the unfinished part. So it is, it is a two-way street. You guys must fight for a better wording of the bond. If you, because my job is to assess my loss exposure and pay to my my, my loss exposure. When I have a bond where I cannot even say, good God, that's unfair. I'm sorry, I have to take the collateral. So fight for a better bond wording that gives the insurance company and the contractor an opportunity to only be penalized for the unfinished part. That's, you don't think that that's fair? Well, well, um... <laughs> Because it can't be finished. The contract can't be finished. You mentioned one company, and I, I give you my word that I will have it examined. Yes, please. <laughs> From that company. No, 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 it's not just them. It doesn't pick. I just pick NHT. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't saying it was them. No, no, no. I wasn't saying that. I was saying that most government entities, a lot of government entities, sometimes we're lucky we get one that gives you the opportunity, but a lot of them just have a demand bond. We say that I get a one line letter that says you're in default, so please send me 15 million. Yes, please look at it. If, if you look at it, then half of your bond problem will be solved. As an insurance company, what I do is I look at my ex exposure and I price that exposure. When I come up with the, the price of the exposure, i.e., for example, 3%, I then apply that, ex, that percentage to the contract sum. Now, the, the extent of the exposure is dependent on the management of the people 
on the site. So if I don't know that the uh, other workers being there, being managed by someone else, you have given me an exposure that I'm not able to price. So I price the exposure. So it is the, it's not the fact that they're not included. It's the fact that I was not aware that they were there, so I couldn't price the exposure. So I may add an extra quarter percent for the exposure. It's difficult to understand, but look at it this way. If, 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 let's go to an insurance for something simple to explain the difference in exposure. If you have a car that you drive to work and back, the exposure to accidents is going to be much less. You, you work from eight to five. You drive to work, you park your car, except when you go out for lunch, come back, go home, and that's it. If you're a taxi man on the road, your car is constantly on the road, the probability that you're going to have an accident to write off that car is definitely higher than the person who uses their car for social and domestic purposes. So the insurance company has an exposure of losses. It prices the losses based on the exposure. So the man who does nothing more than drive his car to work and back gets a lower insurance premium than the person who is on the road running taxi. I need to know what the exposure is so that I can price it. When I price the exposure, if you over the years, let's go back to the relationship because I don't want you to miss the issue of the relationship. We're not pricing exposure. If you know over the years that the relationship has been where you have managed projects and I never had to pay, we can then discount the premium. But I want to know, if you walk into general accident, we call you a direct client. You come through my front door, you would sit down in a room with the expert on underwriting bonds and we have a long questionnaire that will ask a lot of questions and provide you with an advice as to what your bond terms and condition should be. If you walk into general accident, you're a direct client. You are my sole responsibility. I am responsible for giving you the proper advice. The insurance industry is littered with brokers. If you walk into a broker's office, then you don't have a conversation with me. You are the client of the broker. That's the legal relationship. You then are getting the advice from your broker. The conversation I have is with your broker, who should then pass it on to you? And I'm sorry, it's not a cop out. It really is the way the insurance industry operates. If you go to your broker, then you are the client of your broker and I cannot touch you. If I do that, then the broker will sue me. So it depends on where you go. And I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying to you, demand from your broker a proper explanation for what you're covered for so we can take care of the misunderstanding. But certainly if you come to general accident, we will, you can ask us as many questions. Our questionnaire is long. We sit you in a room. We talk to you about it. We point out the pitfalls so you know what you're being covered for. But I can't touch it because I'm broken. There goes your trust factor. <laughs> no, we can't say that. That's not fear. They're brokers. Yes. Just an exception to the question and your answer. Yeah. And what stayed with the sit down with the broker? Be before the purchase or while the project is in progress? I think you should sit down with your broker before the purchase. But can I also explain something to you? Because we have such a strong relationship with our broken community. If you didn't tell us about a subcontractor, and then in the middle of the contract, you realize that you have a subcontractor that's not covered. You can tell us. We put them on the policy immediately. Don't tell us after the accident. Once you now know you have a subcontractor, you can tell us anytime. We can read the contract. You just need to tell us. That's all I'm saying. That's where the trust comes in. Walk in and says, guess what? We now have a subcontractor. Could you add them to the policy? Oh, yes, we can.